stone, because hell is not the only thing that's kept me sane. I mean, uh, most creative people tread along a very slippery edge between. The devil and the deep on one side, and eternity on the other. Uh, you know, schizophrenia is just there, you mean. If you were to stop or something like that, well, lots of people could easily become schizophrenic. I'm not there for preaching the idea that it's therapeutic. Um, mostly, if you want to think in those sort of terms. But it's, it's a way of life. It's part of you, and you accept the belief that... Uh, abilities and endless inventiveness have taken his work through a number of very distinct phases. He believes that a period as complex as our own demands of an artist diversity and versatility. But however varied his styles, Middleton's unmistakable personality declares itself triumphantly in everything he produces. Stern intellectual control directs his technical virtuosity and deepens his search for sacred shapes and patterns in the ordinary universe. Middleton is an unselfish celebrant. His themes are the eternal triangle of landscape, sky and water, of air, water, earth, and the relationship between the contours of the countryside and the female form. These provide the continuum. His preoccupations have remained constant over the years. This is one of the major obstacles. The necessity on one hand uh, to become recognized as an individualist to do something different from anything that anybody's done before. In other words, to establish oneself in the art world, in the field of galleries and of uh, exhibitions and films. To stand out as an individual. And on the other hand, if one is devotional, the struggle on the other side is towards anonymity. Columbus, 1947. I don't think one does or paint entirely for oneself. Uh, one can do that is one can get so obsessed with one's own importance that and a lot of painters who do. But uh, unless a painting has significance uh, to other people or to some other people, uh, to my mind, it's not fulfilling its full function. Uh, the painter has a place in uh, the community, the same as any other uh, doctors, whoever you like, take a lot of A painter has a job to do. Now, you don't do this consciously, but uh, the more one can... Uh, to return to this word of anonymity, the more one can subdue one's own personal problem or overcome it and get into a universal language, the use of universal symbols, universal images, then it will have effect on all sorts of people 
too, may not know why or how, but it has its positive effect. And uh, you're painting with something outside yourself, uh, as well as for the inner man. Uh, Wilderness of Salvador Allende, 1974. A studio is a workroom is the most important thing. And uh, no matter where one sets up, maybe a tiny attic and maybe somewhere an enormous room, one cannot proceed without a studio because all the Almost major work in my mind is made in a workshop, not out of doors. It's different, for, perhaps, for continental painters uh, who worked. I, don't, I suppose some of them still do in the south of France, where you can bank on climatic conditions and go out seven days a week and get the same effect. But to try and do that sort of thing in landscape terms in Ireland, the time you get an easel that was all vanished and turned into another country. So you've got to make it in a workshop for notes, references, photographs, whatever way you take notes, or even bring it back in your head. But the workshop is absolutely essential. All my notebooks are in this room, for instance, and they're there for reference when I want them. There are all these knickknacks that have been gathered from around the world sort of thing that have mostly sentimental attraction. Shapes are also very important, basic shapes. But a lot of these have, if not been, uh, they have inspired shapes that have gone into the paintings. They all have some decided reference. Uh, these are very cherished objects. They're the seeds of the Banksia tree that goes all over Australia. <laughs> the, uh, If you get the right angle on these things, to my mind, they're perfect African sculptures. The carved wood from Africa. But they're fascinating. Really do-it-yourself jobs already made. That is the blossom that eventually turns into that which grows out of here. But it's an extraordinary really primordial sort of uh, growth, like so much of the Australian stuff that goes back beyond history, it hasn't gone any further. Swan River Sunset, 1972. Ah, yes, those are beautiful. I mean, those are pieces of sculpture. This is quite an old one. I had that one given to me. My a very old friend who deals in antiques, and he brought that one for me. It's a lovely one. It's a very old one, not, or relatively old compared to this. This was a, uh, not shuttle. It was one of the survivors after the 41 Blitz on Brookfield factory that I did a lot of work for. And when they were cleaning out the shuttered weaving sheds, I got one as a souvenir, but knew they're absolutely beautiful with these little porcelain eyes and the inside lined with rabbit fur. <laughs> Perfect surrealist objects. Colin Middleton was born in Belfast in January 1910. After living in various parts of Ulster, he has now settled in Bangor, County Down, where Belfast Loch casts up light to his high studio. His father came to the north of Ireland in 1899 to start a damask designing business. He was a man who moved easily in artistic and literary circles. Charles Middleton was a painter himself 
who worked in the manner of the French Impressionists. In the 20s, the seeds of Impressionism had at last blown as far as Belfast. Monet and Pissarro were his father's special enthusiasm and Colin's first affection. To this day, Middleton keeps in his studio a fistful of his father's brushes, household gods in miniature, a grip on the past. My earliest recollection are um, associated with my father's painting. Part of the, my parents' bedroom uh, was the largest room in the house. My cot was in one corner of it, beside my father's easel, which I still use. Uh, uh, and I can still, and still do every time I squeeze out paint, remember the smell of oil paint. But it was very important because the day I smelled oil paint was Sunday and my father would be at home all day. Um, but I was literally reared beside the easel. Childhood is one of the tap roots of creativity. The artist carries with him through life those unresolvable early memories. In Middleton, they have sunk to an imaginative depth and color his work to this day. I was given a, a tin toy, which was like a little coach that had a sort of trailer truck on it. Um, and a box of little colored blocks, rectangular, square, triangular, which I played with for weeks and went on playing with afterwards. And these little blocks were terribly important to me. I used to deliver them here, deliver them there, and all that sort of thing. But the number of paintings now that are built up with little colored blocks, I can still associate with that experience. Sundown Carnal Ridge 2, 1960. The other thing I was so attached to was one of those beautiful wooden clothes pegs. You know, the ones that have a knob, just all, all wood and a slot up the middle. And that was dolled up in various pieces of rags and whatnot and was known as Peggy. And I, thought, I wouldn't go anywhere with that, but that shape pops up again and again and again. So you never know where it starts. Flax, 1957. His father's ill health prevented Middleton from going to art school in England as he had wished. He was obliged to join the small family firm as an apprentice. Only in his spare time was he able to attend evening classes at the Belfast College of Art. Damask designing did not bring him much artistic satisfaction, but it taught him to work quickly and accurately. The processes of weaving have shaped many of his compositions. The ghosts of shuttle and loom harness have not yet been laid. The actual designing, there wasn't a great deal of joy in it because the designs then were all utterly conventional, basically floral. <laughs> uh, but the working out of the body of the cloth for uh, weaving was a fascinating thing. It was all done of squared paper, large sheets of squared paper. Um, one, one sheet of paper to each machine. You'd get three in a row that would go across this room working on things of that size. The paper, the point paper, uh, squared off like graph paper and filled in. The design was drawn, enlarged onto this, and the gap between every two lines represented a thread of the walk, the gap between the black lines. Uh, the shuttle moving across, the weft being carried through this. Everywhere it went over one of those, you put a red dot on there. In other words, you were working out the entire body of the cloth, or a quarter of it. The rest was all done by stringing the harness to make the food sing. But this working on grids, uh, I've always had, at least for the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, I've moved almost onto a grid system. I've painted squares. 
and uh, even when I'm conscious and multiples of three, four, five sort of thing, the grid works out off. Uh, I know it's had tremendous influence on me. I've also had this uh, love and respect for woven textures. Uh, I mean, we don't even landscapes. Some of them are even called tweed landscapes. But it's the richness of a Donegal bog that is like a piece of tweed. It's all woven stuff. Woven Landscape, Lechana, 1971. Charles Middleton died in 1935. Colin took over the business and supported his mother. At the same time, he painted and drew into the small hours to the point of exhaustion. Later, in 1935, he married May McLean, a fellow art student, and now a school teacher. They couldn't afford a home. Uh, there were no split ups or anything like that. It was the awful tension and uh, agony of not having a home of one's own, uh, of always being divided between two families. Uh, and then we had a very nasty period when I made the bill. I couldn't make out what was wrong with her. It just transpired eventually that she had a duodenal ulcer, which penetrated in the tram when she was coming back. She was teaching Methodist College. She had to work as well as I had to work. And four days later, she was dead. That's how that went. But at that time, and it's very significant too, uh, that I was just um, moving into uh, surrealism this inward turning thing. And it was also uh, 1939 when everybody was sitting on tender hooks waiting for the war to break out. And uh, by that time I was actually a committed surrealist. Middleton's dislocated emotions needed the outlet of complex symbols. Vogue. 1939. He explored the dream world of the subconscious with its irrational encounters and violent confrontations. The Fortune Teller, 1941. The Siren. 1941. The horror of the air raids on Belfast paralyzed Middleton's talent for some time. Eventually, he produced a series of impressionist studies of the city, his way of preserving the streets which he loved. His first one-man show was held in the Belfast Museum and Art Gallery in 1943. By that time, the risk of incendiary bombs had receded, and the top floor of the gallery seemed safe enough for paintings. There were 117, I think, paintings hung up, and a gorgeous manifesto of mine all about it, which is still in existence. Um, and it created rather a commotion. Uh, People just couldn't take it, or just lots of them couldn't take it. Actually, from that show, there was one painting, so, uh, but it led to so many things. Uh, it was a uh, tremendous hodgepodge, if you like, but it's practically my journey through um, all the influences of European art and heaven knows what. The Dark Lady, 1941. Middleton has called Flanders his spiritual home. He feels a special affinity with the Flemish primitives. But the painters who mean most to him are Mondrian, Faisan, Vermeer, Della Francesca. He refers to them as his four evangelists. Uh, 
exaggerations of Van Gogh and the later Expressionists have also left their mark. At work on the northwest edge of Europe, Middleton, for reasons of lineage as much as geography, regards himself as a northern painter with Gothic tendencies. He dismisses the Renaissance as the drabest, most miserable period in our history. It was the Renaissance, he claims, that ploughed under the female archetype. Look what we got out of it, he once bellowed at me. Motor cars, hydrogen bombs, the patriarchs have led us to war after war after war. But these things, the imaginations, the imaginative things, uh, together with this Gothic thing that was coming in from my godfather, have all built up into this uh, recognition uh, that basically I'm a northern painter. <laughs> By northern, I mean North European. Uh, Middleton has always let his imagination be fertilized by the work of other painters, Salvador Dali, for instance. I was fortunate once again in seeing the first big Dali one-man exhibition that came to the Reading with her galleries in London. And that was a, an unforgettable experience. That was me, Dali, at his very best. He hasn't gone much further than that. It was far in another, he's digressed in other kitschy ways that I can't abide. But then he was a sheer master. Still is. Uh, on those terms, uh, what, uh, oh, I was profoundly influenced by that. Yeah. But he never imitates superficially. Rather, he works from the inside out. His understanding of other artists' work allows him to rethink their problems, and his conclusions, however similar, are never quite the same. I, Val, 1946. In 1945, Middleton married Kathleen Gibbons, the daughter of a master printer. Two years later, they crossed to England and joined the Middleton Murray community in East Anglia. There, with others, they tilled the neglected fields in a spirit of idealism. Murray prospered but apparently no one else did. Disillusioned, Colin and Kate Middleton returned to Ireland after a year. Very simply in a nutshell, I had uh, been taken up when we came back from Middleton Murray. Community farm, yeah. We'd cut all our cables with the <laughs> linen business, then, which I had spent 20 years in. When we came back, uh, I had no job. <laughs> But my working on the land had done the one thing that that worked a miracle. I discovered I could paint landscape. I'd never been able to do it. But because I'd worked with crops and handled corn, those fresh and stood this and built up uh, but you harvest mangoes and even in the winter sugar beet the whole landscape became a palpable thing for me. I could paint landscape. Ballymon, 1948. And so we came back here, we went back to my house. I was raised in my mother's home in Chichester. Katie and the cats were there. And uh, we'd have the top under the roof, or at least uh, my mother had had it turned into a I uh, think the Sleesby ladder that you went up and that became my studio with a little skylight in it. And I just broke out uh, into paint. Jacob Wrestling with the Angel, 1948. Rachel Listening, 1948. I said we have got a few plans. I'm going to turn to ANC Photography 
I'm going to ask them to come and take photographs of this work and I'm going to send them to Victor Waddington. Because before we had gone to England, Victor had bought a couple of things in Belfast and had been inquiring for more medicines whilst we were away. So we went, we had the photographer come up, he photographed the paintings, we sent the photograph to Victor Waddington, we got a wire back, coming to see you this afternoon, and Victor came up and gave Colin a contract. The writer put me on a map, he so gave us an unbelievable monthly payment. We, uh, monthly payment. Yeah, we end up settling in our glass in a crazy house, and for four and a half years, Colin was under contract. Waddington Galleries, they uh, he paid him. Victor paid him so much month and uh, guaranteed him so many sales. And then came the day we took you to London too. First show was was a joint show with Dan on the um, the second one one man show with the British successful. Tooth were showing me with in their the they have their annual show of painters of Bayman and Promise. And they were hanging me beside Matthew Smith and Augustus yeah. John. I was building up very well. And then the great rocket came. The Americans took London over with action painting and they dropped everybody like a hot brick. The growing family and shortage of money forced Middleton to work as an art master in a number of schools and colleges. Since he prefers to develop an idea or theme in sequences of paintings, the daily round and its distractions must have been particularly menacing. It's very lucky all the same, uh, if I may just add this, that I didn't go into teaching until now. I was in my mid-40s. Uh, I can see how it swallows up a youngster coming in now, absolutely swallows from home. But I was able to hold that bit back for myself all the way through. But uh, when we had to do this, and I got my first appointment at Coleraine Technical School, we had the problem of getting to Coleraine or September without any money. Well, that's when you sold all the things. We had to sell all the contents of the house. But you wouldn't part of the fridge. It was a great big six foot thing, a great big white thing. Like you'd have found a cotton cowman inside, you know. <laughs> the fridge was in the bottom. Yeah, and I was telling you about the Christmas, you know, when the two architects came up. And they said, um, oh, we brought your little Christmas presents, you know, Lord and I were just around in Port Stewart, and we, but we thought we'd call and bring you a little present, and they gave us this little box of cheese. It was a little box about yes, that size, and, and a jar of dill and cucumbers. So cucumbers. they were in the kitchen, which was the only room downstairs in that house, and uh, so, yeah. Uh, Raymond opened the fridge to put the cheese and the cucumbers in. Come and do us nothing else. I did. So he very tactfully said, Well, of course, the main reason why Nora and I called was uh, that we thought you might like a meal in the kind of food. So, of course, the two kids were in bed, and uh, I sort of slipped up and told them we were going out to have a meal. And took us into the kind of food, and they uh, put out all this. Uh, teaching in 1970 to devote all his time to painting.
control and knowledge of his medium must be nearly complete. He has a deep respect for his material. He slowly explores their attributes as he celebrates the patterns of a dry stone wall in one place, the line of a plantation of trees in another. The intimate nature of rocks, pebbles, trees and plants concerns him just as much as the grander configurations of mountain, mud flat or cockle strand. As he himself has said, the images are coaxed from the amorphous material and move toward realization in much the same way as the elements work upon wood and stone. A process of erosion, the polish of wind and rain, the action of sand, or the trace of a thorn. Yeah. I presume there's a date on that. 
can tell you what day, but that's the earliest of this batch, I think. That's Hastings with the old uh, net towers on the beach at Hastings, which have now, alas, been demolished. Well, uh, and, and what date is this one? I can't tell you but exactly. It's beyond the bag of that thing. It's not in the bottom, excuse me. No. No, well, that would be the earliest, I think. And there's an old friend. Uh,
idea of somebody going to, to Spain to pay the one thing and then going to Donegal and painting it in the same manner. It's absolutely ridiculous. You're imposing your vision on it and not letting it work on you. I mean, I'd be chastised for this all down the line because I don't have a set of style. There's a hell of a lot of people that don't know enough about me work to discover that there is a sinful connection with them all. But the idea of going to Donegal to print like you do in Spain or in the South of England is absolutely ridiculous. But people go and impose their vision on the bloody thing because personality is the only thing that people are concerned with at the moment. Yes, you've been accused of having too many styles. Yeah. One of these days I discovered that it was a blessing. Why not? Paint has been my obsession all my life. And I've gone out of my way to find out as much as I can about other painters. What the hell are other painters for? They open gates for you. If you haven't got the guts to go through and try to get a bit of experience, it doesn't mean you're imitating what they're there for. They're opening your eyes to something else. You walk through the pulp clay door. You don't imitate them, but if you're genuine, you can actually become pulp clay in time. What the devil are painters there for if you won't go through the gate that they ask you to? So you don't mind this criticism anymore? Oh, I've had to live with it for so long. It does really distress me that there aren't enough discerning people to stop um, emphasizing diversity and look for the chord that is there. It's still there. Uh, what does the, the, the term symbol mean to you, Colin? I could give it in two words. Communicating vessel. <laughs> the bridge between the known and the unknown. Um, it's definitely the meeting point between the known and the expressible, and that which lies beyond it, which hasn't got a language. Now, the two meet in a communicating vessel, uh, which is the symbol. And it can't be expressed in any other way, and it can't be analyzed, because there's part of it is, is yet unnamed or talked about, and the other which is. But it's basically the link between, if you like, the conscious and unconscious, in terms of experience. I don't mean, you know what I mean, psychologically. But that, the symbol is where the two meet. Southern Cross, 1975. The symbol of you know as a poet uh, that there are certain phrases that can only exist as such. The elegant through the earth don't, but to try to take them to pieces consciously. If you can break through the person who's shell, you're on the French island. But it's got the meat on the bridge between. And when it clicks, you get an truth. Fox Glove, 1946. The female form, in varying degrees of abstraction, emerges with an archetypal grandeur out of surfaces which capture the essence, the very feel of an antrum or a mourn landscape. suggest the contours and patterns of field and hill. In her service, the textures of stone, of woods like sycamore and ash, may also be evoked. The female may take root and become a tree which harbors owls, the breasts growing like fruit. Or she may simply settle back in serene celebration of the drumlins and shallow valleys of County Down. The female archetype gives continuity to Middleton's work, 
in all her disguises. The earth mother, the mother and child, the reclining figure, the single tree against a hill. So what is your own work to the celebration of the female principle? Oh, Lord, yes, certainly. Most certainly. What does that represent for you, the female principle, if you know? Creativity. The other half of me. <laughs> Consciously male, there's bound to be a female half somewhere, me dear old grandma and all that. But basically, it's a worship of the female. I'm not interested in uh, uh, Greek athletes and things like that. I'm not even interested in the chorus de Folie Berger. I thought that you might see one. Hang on. But not the others. Do you think that your art might? Most of the female part of you. No, no, no. It's got to be accommodation. After all, the ultimate business of integration is to integrate your male quality and your female quality as such into her mother. Namely, last for five minutes, and they sunder again, bring them together. Sunder them, bring them together. It's the optimistic thing. Thank you. 